This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blayton. And I'm Sam Mercier's. This week, we're without Patrick Gulo. That's all right. We were, we were going to have a sub, but oh, stuff man. happens. Oh. Stuff happens. Um, so normally we like to start with, with some news, and, and we'll get to that. But uh, Nate and I had a pretty cool experience yesterday. Mm. Uh, we went. We thought we'd tell you about it. We went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is, uh, I don't know, like two and a half hour drive from, from where we live in Grand Rapids, where the Philip Glass Ensemble was performing um in in preview performances uh einstein on the beach they're about to go on a on a world tour with einstein and it's pretty exciting uh, it was it was a pretty cool experience what did you think nate it's pretty brilliant i've uh <laughs> unlike most of my friends i think i i'm actually a big philip glass fan in <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that I, I i've i've enjoyed listening to his music for a long time and um I have I often have a really hard time exactly figuring out why I like it or what about it I like because I'll like most of the other music I like I have really specific things that I can talk about with it something about the Philip Glass I think I have just some kind of infatuation with the culture around it but seeing the opera was a lot different than listening to Einstein on the beach for the the couple times that I've listened through and it was it was really incredible the staging and just the whole story that the whole the opera as a whole told was was really really cool to experience and quite something especially like in Michigan with Philip Glass there and everything it was right it's pretty cool right um, it, I, I will say that Glass is not my favorite and Einstein is not my favorite <laughs> even in Glass <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm glad I'm glad that I went to see it and if even if you don't like Philip Glass or Einstein I highly recommend going to see it because as Nate said it is a very, very different experience than listening to it. I mean, obviously, we've we've all heard recordings in in every, you know, every music history class that we've taken that covers the the late twentieth century, and we've you know had been assigned to listen to it by you know every everybody that we know, but you, you just it's a completely different thing. Yeah. Uh, what was the uh, runtime of the entire show? It's it's the uh, five hour production i mean it's not it's not a short thing Mm -hmm. um they warned us that it was going to be four and a half at at the beginning or in in the program i guess as well and so they they had special like i guess as as is traditional for this opera a special announcement that like yeah you're you're supposed to leave and go or come and go as you want because four and a half hours is a really long time right (laughs) because there's there's no no intermission. intermission yeah yeah um but it was a very cool thing, and it, and it was it was definitely still preview performances. This is not the the cleanest it it could have been. Yeah. It it will. I'm sure it'll be cleaner when they get there. Out of the millions of notes that they played last night, they missed like seven, and that's kind of a lot. For <laughs> I would say there were more than seven. There were some holes stepped in. Yeah. No. Uh, I, I mean, they did an incredible job, and it was it was it, really cool to see this right. stuff. And yeah, it makes you wonder what. What a real performance would be like, you know. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we just thought we we we'd, we'd mention that, and and if 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 the tour is coming anywhere near you, you should you definitely take it take a minute and, and try to find it. This is not the kind of thing that gets performed a lot, uh, particularly by the Glass Ensemble. It's yeah. it's again not even if it's not your favorite, you can't deny its significance. So. Yeah. I'm I'm glad we saw it. Anyway. Awesome. So what Let's, time did you guys get home? Oh, like three. Yeah. <laughs> it was ugly. Uh, Very nice. It was a long day, which is, I, you know, about 12 hours after we left. Yeah. I <laughs> saw the, the secret agent man uh, uh, Dave tracking uh, link. Oh, yeah. I, fo- I followed you. It's cool. Every time you would go back to it, it would, uh, you know, it wouldn't just show you where you are. It would start back at the beginning of where you had last seen it and then trace it for you. Right. So it oh, cool. brings you up to date. It was cool. This is, is that glimpse, by the way, G O Y M P S E. If you're curious, this is, is it expensive? App. No, it's free. Uh, nice. It's free yeah. for, for iPhone and Android. And, uh, you can send somebody a link or you can tweet a link as I did yesterday and it will just, you know, track your place on a Google map. Anyway. Um, that's 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 uh, Einstein on the beach, and it was neat. Uh, let's dig into uh, 
some some things that don't directly involve us. <laughs> that's that's what we specialize in is talking about other people. Yeah. And, and telling them what they're doing wrong with their lives. That's right. That's right. Or what they're doing right. Like the good folks at the New World Symphony. Uh, we we talk a lot on the show about, you know, trying to figure out ways to get people butts in the seats, you know. And uh, for the people watching the video version, you can see the image. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you've got that actual image, the one with all the uh, neon and stuff. Yeah. I'll pull um, it up. Yeah. In, and, in... Uh, you know, it's a show where they're mixing uh, an orchestra playing sort of arrangements of certain pieces. One of those is by Heinrich Bibber. So just imagine this. <laughs> there you go. So that's what it's like. Yeah. Is that is that really what you think it was like, Sam? <laughs> uh, that was uh, that was actually I was playing. That was an course. artist rendering. <laughs> <laughs> that was an artist rendering. No, they are doing that piece, and you know it's an appropriate tempo. I can imagine people back in s s whenever this was written. It actually says on the. Oh, we got we got website. a little Mason Bates. Yeah, back in 1673, you know, uh, people danced to music that sounded a lot like that. And it's, it's got a, an appropriate... Yeah, but I don't think they were daggering. <laughs> but it's got an appropriate techno beat. The point being that people Can I say like daggering the... is this on a family show? I, I, I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> okay. Well, if you don't know what it is, then I guess you won't be offended. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we're safe, Dave. <laughs> just, so, just promise me you won't look it up on Urban Dictionary right now. <laughs> don't do it right now. <laughs> Um, they're also doing a Nigel Westlake uh, piece that it's actually, I looked at, you can find it on uh, YouTube and see a great performance. It's a um, marimba quartet for four players and two marimbas. Cool. And, uh, and then a, you know, some sort of, I don't know how they're integrating the Mason Bates parts, but doing a Slanimsky ear box, which uh, is pretty cool. Dave, did you see the link to that I sent you earlier? The link to what? Oh, yes. <laughs> So Slinovsky's earbox is a great John Adams piece. Yeah, um, it's pretty cool. It and trying to imagine what they're going to do to, I don't know if they're just going to play it down. I don't know how many of these are going to have some, uh, you know, not written by the composer parts right. added or whatever. Well, I mean, Mason, you mentioned Mason Bates, and he's he's one of these, uh, you know, hipster composers. He's he, he does, he's not only a composer, he's also a DJ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I don't, it seemed like he wasn't listed in the program on so I, I, I'm guessing he was just a DJ. But, I mean, they, they turned their hall, which is a beautiful hall, and we actually talked about it when they opened it last year, mm -hmm. um, into a nightclub selling, you know... Well, a they, nightclub... They had, they had drinks and... It looks a little bit like a nightclub that Disney designed, you know? It's a little... <laughs> what do you mean? It's the just the, the the brilliance of the color. It looks like you're at Disney or a gay club, one, way, one or the other. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you're if you're wanting to get kids in there, I think it's a good way to do it. Yeah. Um, get kids in there? What are you, fifty eight? Kids. Those kids with the music and the hair <laughs> and the clothes. What are they doing to this symphony? Uh, That's what you sound like to me just now. Awesome. So anyway, people, people in the area down there should check it out. It looks like it would be a pretty interesting I evening. <clears throat> Yeah, it, yeah, it looks very cool, and it, it's the sort of thing. It's it's called Pulse is the name of the the series, um, and it's I, it seems like the sort of thing that has potential to, to, to be around for a while. Mm -hmm. Though it seems also like a huge undertaking, and I think this is the kind of thing that would prevent um, a lot of other orchestras, not just the aesthetics of it, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. Like this, that's a lot more work for a lot more people mm -hmm. than presenting Beethoven and Brahms, you know. Yep. And uh, I, I don't know how many extra people have to be involved just in the planning for something like this, not to mention the execution. Um, right. And and I wonder what the uh, the audience is like. You yeah. Know? I don't know. Maybe I bet a friend of the show, Drew McManus, might know how it's going down there. 
So you, I, I, to me, I think the the thing that would that would make or break this is how the audience treats the situation. Yeah. I feel like I'm the kind of lame ass that would go to something like this and sit and just watch and listen, <laughs> and not right. like treat it like a nightclub. And I would just treat it like this curiosity that I kind mm -hmm. of want to see. Well, you are also a, a classical music aficionado. Who That's is, true. Is, is I'm a, a snob. Regular, yeah, <laughs> you are a regular well, concert goer as well. So maybe this isn't like you aren't the audience that they're trying to draw in. Well, you know, I've been to a lot of shows. Uh, and played in a lot of shows where there's a mix of people who are very into the band and what they're going to do is they're going to show up and they're going to stand there in front and they're going to listen yeah. and then other people are going to do normal nightclub dance music kinds of things and a good space is one that allows both and a bad space is one that like really encourages one or the other if the goal is to be able to have both yeah and I and, think, uh, and that's yeah, go ahead. and I, I think that's key where it, like in an orchestra concert in a normal hall, you could go out in the lobby and probably watch on some monitor or hear. Like they they have that there so that you can know which <laughs> one to come in between movements or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that that's that's there. I think that that's bringing those two worlds closer together, of the outside and the inside, so that so that you can quit more quickly change between and I not, think it's not cool. be afraid of getting close to the stage if you're in the lobby. Think of uh, think of a, a, a noise version of what they have in Michigan, the, the rotating doors, you know. It's designed to let you get in and not let the heat out and the cold air in, you know. Some right. sort of passive system where you go into the not-as-loud zone and that transfers you into the walking-in zone so mm -hmm. that you are always can come and go and you don't have to wait for anything to happen. Yeah, and I think more sophisticated clubs have that kind of system, like, yeah. really right. well worked out. Yeah. Where like you can go to the dance floor and you won't be bothered by <laughs> the the noise of the bar or anything like that. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, well, so anyway, yeah. from new world um to incredibly old world. Uh, uh, uh. You know, I'm worried about this story actually. Uh there's a premiere of, of a Brahms work that we're talking about. I'm worried that we're going to lose our new music street cred on this show <laughs> because we're going to play Brahms in a minute. And last week we played just Waldo. <laughs> so yep. Well, I will we say we really are composers and we really do like weird new music. I just don't like Einstein on the beach. Well, as we mentioned on the show last week, there's a, a Brahms piece that was discovered. It's actually been discovered quite a while ago, but I guess the musicologists have finally decided that it's ready for presentation to the world. It, it is indeed Brahms. Yes, it is indeed Brahms. It has been confirmed by leading experts, um, written when top he was scientists. 20, as, as, we, as we talked about. Our, our top musicologist scientists, <laughs> government-funded lab, yeah. in the Defense Advanced Research Project. We see some, we, we see some person a in a lab coat turn toward the camera and give a thumbs up. <laughs> Mr. Jones, we have top men working on it. <laughs> Who? Top men. Four out of five musicologists agree. <laughs> <laughs> this is, in fact, Brahms. <laughs> yes. So, as we mentioned, written when he was 20, and it has already been premiered, but um, uh, Radio 3, BBC Radio 3, on Saturday uh, had a live performance, and uh, I think we're going to play a little bit of it, aren't we? We are indeed. The big deal with this piece is that uh, 12 years from the time this was written, um, he wrote a horn trio, and basically all of the content... Uh, motivic and harmonic stuff that's in the piece shows up um, in the horn trio. So sort of all the component parts of the horn trio, which I also listen to on YouTube, and it sounds very much that way to me, um, are heard in this piece, which is an interesting thing as a composer just showing I think everybody, when they latch onto that one thing that's cool, they're not going to just discard it. They're going to find the best time to reuse that and contextualize it in a different way and right. get more mileage out of it. That's right. You yeah. Because, you know, mu music's hard. we got to do, do do everything we can with the stuff we got, and also that's right. takes revision, multiple tries, and like, yeah, you know, keep 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 going with it for sure. And, right. and before before we move on with the recording, I want to state, and I'd like to say that friend of the show Matt Shandorf is in agreement with me. Uh, the G Naturals sound are are, are are I like the G Naturals better than G Sharp. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you'll you'll hear the noted question, and they talk about it later in the interview. Um, where they argue that he should have used a G-sharp, quote, should have used a G-sharp, and, and he doesn't. He uses a G, and it, it's really crunchy. So, cool. 
but it's cool. All right. So so here it is. This is a little bit of uh, a, a recording of this new uh, piano. This is short piano work by y- Johannes Brahms. New music by Brahms. It's very, very exciting indeed. Andres, let's, let's hear it then. The piece that Christopher's given the title of Album Platt, a, a little leaf of an album by Brahms. <laughs> Right, but uh, that was that was new music by Johannes Brahms. That's very <laughs> kind of exciting. Yeah, and a, and a pretty cool piece. Uh, the the guys on the sh- radio show critique it for being having a middle section that wanders a little aimlessly, um, and I can maybe that's true. But I like the way Brahms wanders very much. Mm-hmm. You a big Brahms fan? I am a big Brahms fan, and like I said, it's probably just because I played the clarinet sonatas. And uh, that's got all the gooey best stuff that Brahms came up with right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not like I'm, I'm. You know, I don't slap on academic festival overture to work out to in the morning or anything like that. <laughs> his uh, his chamber music I really like. Symphonic music really not so much. Um, I mean, it sounds like big romantic orchestral music to me, mm-hmm. and and you know, I got to be in the right mood to to listen to that. But his chamber music I always uh, enjoy. Yeah. yeah. So. For something completely different. <laughs> this is I. I don't even. I can't even make a, a slick segue here. Uh, big news this week. Uh, maybe that's the transition. Big news in Brahms. Big, big news, news in the United yeah. States government. <laughs> so we just listened to Brahms over the internet. Speaking of the internet. <laughs> Uh, if you tried to go to any websites on Wednesday this week, this is not necessarily specifically a classical music-related story, but it certainly has an impact on uh, music and art and entertainment. Uh, the, is and the culture and democracy and freedom. And those of us <laughs> developing internet content. Sure. And and people people like little old us. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, if you tried to get to any big internet site any big websites on wednesday like reddit or wikipedia or boing boing you may have noticed that they were uh unavailable or at least obscured in some way uh, and that's because their publishers were uh, staging a protest on the web about the web which i think is pretty interesting against a couple of pieces of legislation that are currently uh in committee in congress in the house there's the stop online piracy act or sopa and in the senate there is the protect ip act or pippa or pipa depending on who you talk to uh i like pippa so it doesn't get confused with the uh chinese loot but i really like pipas so pipa is a nice thing (laughs) whatever floats your boat whatever wets your whistle Mm -hmm. fine with me um, but anyway, there there are uh, a lot of people who have major problems with this. Anybody who doesn't have a major problem with this uh, makes a fair amount of money from um, large entertainment companies. Uh, but anyway, there, some of the more troubling provisions and, and the reasons that uh, the Internet was up in arms as, as a community about them are that uh, SOPA and PIPA would allow 
the government to basically take away any domain name that they thought uh, infringed on anyone else's copyright. And anybody could claim this infringement, and if they were able to convince somebody else that there was infringement, uh, or, or in, and the bar was set very low, the domain could be taken away. The domain is the .com part of the so-and-so.com. Our domain is soundnotion.tv. Mm -hmm. um, and what that essentially does is it makes it really hard for anybody to find a website. It doesn't make it impossible, but it, for practical purposes, for any normal person, makes it impossible to find a website. So there's no uh, due process there, and there's no even legal finding of fact there. There's just the claim and then the website's gone. Mm. Um, so this is uh, a, a, a serious breach of, of uh, freedom of expression and due process rights. And uh, the internet was not wild about this. this. This opens up a huge problem for any modern website that, like most successful modern websites, make themselves a platform, as we say, for user-generated content. This includes places like uh, even even MySpace, a lot of people still use their MySpace pages to share music. Um, people that upload performances to YouTube, which is a huge, huge resource for a lot of people in, in music, and new music in particular, where it's hard to find um, performances of a lot of things. YouTube is a great resource. Um, SoundCloud is becoming a great resource for things like this. Um, and those websites would just have to change their policies dramatically regarding posting content, if, if not shut down entirely, because they couldn't risk uh, some Yahoo you know, posting something that somebody else thought was copyrighted and losing their domain name. You know, imagine Google losing the right to post a website at YouTube.com. Well, when you, when you have that proposal coupled with the fact that you know your kids spaghetti art when they bring it home from kindergarten is copyrighted and for their to, for their life plus 70 years 90 um 90 yeah <clears throat> oh. you're you're not going to avoid situations where s some content that someone could claim some kind of copyright infringement on uh is is going to be present it's to the point that it's cost and or labor prohibitive to do so that's why websites wouldn't be able to go uh, right. continue on there's no way this kind of self-policing can be done and the the big content providers I mean, that would be great with them um that's what they would like um right so yeah it, it's uh, amazing that in such a short amount of time um people sort of realized that they could say something about it and did and then before you know it a whole bunch of representatives have switched i think is the case is that not correct Right. This is, I think, the most exciting thing is, is the number of people, the number of, of legislators who were moved by Wednesday's protests. Uh, Ars Technica, a great tech blog, counted uh, 19 senators. So 19 out of a total of 100 senators, just due to um, Wednesday's protests, switched to being uh, oppo to opposing uh, the the Protect IP Act. Yeah. Um, so that's huge, and there was, uh, I, I don't know exactly how many representatives, but probably around 30, maybe more, uh, switched in, in the House. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that's huge for the Internet. This is, I, I, I had this conversation with Tim Rosenberg on Music is Hard on Thursday. I think this is a, a historic event, um, the first time that the, the Internet has stood up for itself as a group like these these are communities that don't have any relationship with one another google even blacked out the the google logo on google.com um uh we, but they have no relationship with wikipedia or reddit uh a yeah. huge huge credit to this goes to alexis ohanian uh one of the founders of, of reddit.com for putting this protest together and you know picking the day and building a coalition around it um he actually has a good quote talking about the proposed legislations, saying that it's an industry trying to legislate their way back into existence. That's exactly what's, what's happening. Yeah. Um, because there's, there's absolutely no evidence that piracy has hurt 
large content manufacturers, mm -hmm. if anything, there's there's evidence that it has helped them. What they want to do is uh, not to have to change the way they do business because that's expensive, and they want ways to uh, sue people for more and more money um, than they can now. There's the the GAO released a, a study in in I think 2009 maybe saying that it's it's impossible to demonstrate uh, any lo like theoretically impossible to demonstrate any financial loss to content manufacturers due to piracy. And in fact, Switzerland uh, has no law against piracy for personal use. You can mm -hmm. download and use any media that you want as long as it's just for you to use. Yeah. Um, and a study there found that this law actually has uh, had a positive impact on uh, content creators. People who download more stuff, uh, pirate more, more content, actually spend more money buying content. Mm -hmm. um, and and the business model is not to sue the crap out of people. The business model is to make it uh, available conveniently and easily and at a reasonable price. We've yep. seen that with with digital music, right? Right. If it's easier to music to piracy get is, is is pretty much gone. Yeah. Right. Nobody pirates music anymore because you can just go to iTunes and it's ninety nine cents. Done. Right. Yep. It's easier and cheaper. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, that um, you know, movies and books will figure that out eventually, but they're not yeah. there yet. So, so a, a sentiment that I've seen expressed in some of the <clears throat> stuff uh, I've read about the movement has to do with um, people starting to consider it not as something that they need to pay attention and do something about just when a crisis point is approaching, but to realize that, um, you know, if you care about personal liberty and freedom of expression, it's something that you need to think about. Especially um, on the web. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Think about and, and like consider in your sort of political understanding, um, consider it a true place where liberty and democracy can, can be protected, but it has to be protected and not something that you just go and do something when something horrible is about to happen because yes. the horrible legislation is going to come back. Right. And if we don't, if people don't start putting this more and, you know, engage with it as a, an active pursuit of freedom instead of just something that's like you jump on to prevent this one thing from happen happening, yeah. they're eventually going to get at least some of what they want. Yes. And, and I, I will also point out that when asked about it in a primary debate in South Carolina, all of the Republican candidates now have decided that they don't want any piece of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Let's not romanticize it and pretend that somehow what happened with the blackout and subsequent, you know, you know, online traffic has convinced anyone or, you know, right. convinced any it's we've scared them, which is to me is even cooler. It's proven that, you know, you can have like what the Occupy movement is interested in, a more direct hand in the democracy you find yourself operating in. Yeah, exactly. And, the, the internet was able to say, now hold on just a damn minute. And this mm. is, the, yeah, exactly. And and it's not just that, that Wikipedia went dark. It's that Wikipedia went dark and convinced enough people to contact their representatives. Yeah, this is I, I called, I called has both some of numbers our, on it. I, yeah, I, I, called, <laughs> I called both of our senators in, in Michigan and my, my local representative, <laughs> um, I don't know if that had an effect on anything, but you know, I sent them emails and I did it. I found a site that was had a perfectly succinct, well written uh, boilerplate thing, and I used that. And yeah, it's still an email slamming into their inbox, and it has the had the the effect it was needed to have. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, nobody's actually having a conversation with anybody. There's right. This, there's some you know schmuck intern staffer that sits there and tallies yeah. how many people called in against this and how many people called in in favor of it. And, that's it. Right, and that's the thing I like on an article on SlashGear.com. Uh, they say 162 million people saw Wik Wikipedia's blackout page, and then from there they directed to like eight million of those people went to search for their uh, their elected representatives contact right directly from that, and like right, that's big. That's yeah. a pretty big percentage, actually. That's more than I would have guessed. Right. A million um, yep. people. That's a so lot of that calls. One thing that I want to encourage everyone to do, since this is a music podcast and we're talking not not just to people that are fans of music, but to people that actually make music. I know our audience is made up of a lot of both composers and performers. Um, it's, it's great to contact your representatives, and you should absolutely do that. But um, there are a lot of people that are a lot closer to you 
that we need to work on flipping on this yes. issue. Um, this is first. I, I didn't mention this, but you know, legislation like this is not new. We already have in law the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which has um, a number of good provisions, but a number of problematic ones as well. One of them is is the safe harbor, which is a fantastic tool for sites like YouTube that allow uh, user generated content. Is as long as YouTube is is reasonably good at putting a system in place that prevents uh, piracy and gives content creators some system uh, for pointing out things that they think violate copyright. Uh, YouTube is safe. Uh, they, they can't be sued and uh, can't be harmed by this. And that's one of the things that SOPA and PIPA would pretty much get rid of. Um, but they have a system for uh, bringing down content from YouTube. And it mega can be upload. And well, I don't want to talk about mega uploads, a whole crazy thing. But the point is they took it down without the law that they're proposing. Well, any, yeah, exactly. What I was going to say is they've taken down episodes of Sound Notion TV podcast from YouTube. Right. Um, and and I, I mentioned this on Music is Hard, but there's an episode of Streamers and Punches that is currently unavailable in the nation of Germany. Uh, Interesting. Because it violates certain copyright laws and it has been disputed by, uh, I think, Sony has a problem with a clip of audio that we used in in that episode so anyway it's 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 not something that can just go away lightly and the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up for musicians all the professional organizations for musicians uh are in favor of these some of the the, the <sighs> groups that are involved in lobbying uh in favor of stop online piracy act and protect ip act are they're not just the Motion Picture Association of America and the Recording Industry Association of America. It's also ASCAP, it's BMI, it's CSAC, it's the American Federation of Musicians. It's all of these groups that I know a lot of our audience is a member of. So if you have contacts higher up in those organizations that, uh, that I know it's likely that you're a member of, please try to bend their ear on this issue as well it's really important not only that we contact the people that are making the laws and tell them that this is a bad idea it's important that we convince the people uh that that are actually you know the 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 market pressures for this the the economic pressures for this mm -hmm. that this is this is not a successful way to stop piracy the worst part of these things is they're not going to stop piracy right, right. there's no te it's theoretically impossible to create a technology that stops piracy it's, it's not anything that, right. that's going to work the only thing that's going to happen is that you're going to screw up the internet for people uh that are just trying to use the internet legally and normally no more no more big time entrepreneurs on online right it's um, going to destroy <clears throat> even sites like twitter that just link to to pirated oh, content yeah. you know twitter um, and facebook would be dead Dave, an issue similar to what you just brought up, uh, I mean, actually, it's sort of the same thing, but just more generally, um, and I've tweeted about this, smart people that are in your circle of friends that you know that just don't get it, and they might be older people who don't really contextualize the internet and what it means to their life in the same way you do, try and convince those people that this is important. I know a lot of smart people who either support it or have zero opinion. And it seems like if you're a musician or a creative individual in this country, you need to have an opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you want to argue about this with us, we would welcome, we would welcome that discussion. I guess argument <laughs> is not what I would welcome, but I would, I would certainly welcome uh, a discussion. Mm -hmm. Discussion. Uh, so you can, you can do that with us on Twitter. Uh, we're, we're putting up our Twitter handles at the bottom of the screen as we go along. And uh, you can also find us soundnotion.tv slash SN and comment on this episode. So um, please, if, you, if you've gotten issues, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so anyway, we can now uh, step down off our soapbox, I think. <laughs> are, we all, are we all done soapboxing? I'm, I'm satisfied. Yes. <clears throat> all right. This Sermon week on NPR... Over. NPR hit it, Sam. Uh, this week on NPR, they had uh, a uh, what they called NPR music field recordings, 
and uh, there's a, a really uh, it's a fun series. It's a, a fun, fun idea. Series. And it's a really well, this one is a really well done video of a piece being performed in a Lowe's. Yeah. It's called a Mantra, uh, Post Minimalist Percussion in Aisle 12. Well, Mantra, I think, isn't that the name of the ensemble? Oh, okay. That's the ensemble. I I just listened to the music. I didn't really read about yeah. it. <laughs> timber. The uh, yeah, piece is Timber. This is, actually, I think, didn't So Percussion record this recently? I don't know. But I'll, I'll look for that could, recording, yeah. It could be imagining it. It seems like something they do. It's pretty good. So, anyway, so, you, so tell us about this recording, Sam, while I cue it up. Well, uh, we're going to be moving on to creative spaces here in a minute, which I thought it was funny <laughs> that uh, I, I was when I'm watching it, I'm trying to imagine, you know, getting your head screwed on straight and getting ready to really perform in Lowe's with, you know, the guy and his kid walking around looking at you and people trying to ignore you and this kind of thing. It's uh, but it, it's it's uh. They use materials from the Lowe's and perform this piece. I mean, the video explains it yeah, more better cool. than I can. Here, here, here's, uh, here's a little bit of that video. It's very, very well produced. Interestingly, Michael Gordon, uh, when he originally wrote this piece of music, um, he didn't write it for two by fours. He didn't write it for wood. He didn't know actually what the instruments were going to be. I mean, technically, it's a samantra, which is uh, a Greek liturgical percussion instrument. Really, honestly, it's just a two by four. It's, uh, you can uh, obtain them at your local hardware store. Uh, you just have to dry it out and you get this amazing sound world uh, just by cutting the various um, instruments uh, at graduated lengths. So that's a little bit of uh, this field recording by uh, NPR. Uh, they're doing this this whole series. There, uh, there are several more in here of... of not all new music some of it's it's older music but it's in places where you wouldn't expect to have uh, a, a classical concert it's a little it, it's a little reminiscent of uh and we we just mentioned this a couple weeks ago actually uh <coughs> excuse me the the washington post joshua bell experiment oh right um yeah, playing but in the subway. it's it's not designed to be like a sneaky thing you no. know like nobody's hiding the fact that this was planned and that these are you know serious performers um but it's i think a really nice thing to have these surprise performances in unexpected spaces to have the arts kind of invade other parts of your life is a really interesting thing and and i was i was watching this video earlier this week and thinking to myself man i want to be a part of not you know putting a, a performance together like this and making a fantastic video documentary of it like this i mean this is a, a just overall a, a really great production and a fantastic performance by mm -hmm. by the the group mantra um we seem to have lost sam um so our our, our three is down to two and then there were two halfway <laughs> through the agatha christie novel um <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on this name? Yeah, I mean that that piece is cool, and the like you were saying about doing it in a creative space is pretty neat. I what I liked was that they um, like this piece in particular. They uh, in the video they talk about how it's written for these traditional instruments that are like this specific kind of wood made in a specific way, and they're kind of hard to get. But it's basically just two by fours, and so they they built like and what better place to <laughs> 
do a piece with two by fours than in a Lowe's where you can like not even bring anything, just build it there out, out of the out of the stuff that they have, which was is a pretty neat idea. And then so they they put on contact. I don't think they do built it there, did they? Well, in in the video, they they show. They like show them putting the constructing it all on. together, or in constructing the sawhorses that they do, and I don't know if they did any cutting, so they might have brought the parts. Right. But it's still a, it's a pretty neat idea, and right. like that kind of creative presentation is is like, I mean, that was somebody's idea to like yeah. do that. And, and that's part of it, I think, is the the connection between the 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 materials of the the music and the space. Yeah. And I think. I don't know if all of these are going to have that, you know, direct connection, but I really like the yeah. idea that like, oh, this is like art that was made out of that thing over there and that stuff over there. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of tools and bada bing, we got this this amazing piece of music. And it's a really cool piece, too. Yeah. And along the lines of what Sam was saying about the creative space, this one of the percussionists was uh, talking about how he, he grew up doing like what they like they went into lows and <laughs> were h hitting using their mouths like testing out some of the stuff that was in there just to see what it sounds like and he said that that was one of the things that he did growing up was like his mom would yell at him for using a meat cleaver to, to play the windowsill and stuff and get like just that uh, using creative spaces in that way <laughs> is pretty fun yeah <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I would use the meat cleaver to play any instruments that I wanted to mm. play again. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the windowsill. Like. Sure, <laughs> particularly something that's part of a building. It's a relatively cheap repair, though. You know, cheaper <laughs> cheaper than getting new strings for my viola, at least. You know. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, those are that's that's a series that NPR Music is is started called Field Recordings, uh, and it'll go along nicely, I think, with their tiny desk concerts which if you haven't seen or, or these little concerts yeah. that they do basically in a small little office um and and it's cool and again always video recorded very well right very well documented and like with great sound good presentation and that's a neat thing where they aren't like it's a little bit novel that they're doing it in this different space but it's also just a solid performance and it sounds great and and so it's it's neat but not at the loss or not at the detriment of the music at all or anything Right, so yeah. So I think we should we should just move on without Sam. You know, he'll get his act together or he won't. <laughs> one of these days, Mercedes. One of these days. Man, I wanted to hear about his creative space though. So speak speak from from creative performance spaces to creative creation spaces. Uh, there's a, an interesting piece by Rob Deemer in New Music Box this week, uh, talking about um, some of the ideas about creative spaces that he has discovered um throughout his uh his interviews if you remember rob has been doing these interviews with composers over the last i don't he's probably doing it for a year or two now um yeah. kind of in preparation for some eventual presentation of this and he's been asking them about their spaces and he's probably i would imagine he's seen a lot of their spaces in person as well um and he, he talks about um you know what just the 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 stuff that they have around them when they're writing music um and i think it's it's a really interesting look at uh kind of comparing how an, a lot of different composers work he he brings in uh some of these things that they they have in common yeah um, i like these five elements that, that it boils down to where there's a door that you can close right and i think that's <laughs> key yeah Something that you can, you know, s shut yourself off, off from everybody else. Yeah, and a desk to work at. And often that varies wildly bet between, like, having this custom thing from Ikea or, or whatever. Um, and then A custom thing from Ikea? I guess that's a combination <laughs> of the two ideas, of two, the two extremes. Of building something in a DIY setup or, or getting a little cheap desk. Yeah. Um, I have a folding table. <laughs> uh, my desk is a, is a folding table. It's yeah. it's a big folding table too. I, I get any space to spread out. Yeah, and then a monitor, a big freaking monitor, as he says in the yes. article. And uh, not just a monitor, to quote the article, a big freaking monitor. <laughs> right, that's important. Yep, and then a piano keyboard, and I mean that seems like 
a, a very common thing of composers who use a piano. It's not certainly like by no means everybody, because I know a lot of people, like myself, I'm not. <laughs> I'm better at other things than I am at playing piano, and so I don't always use that. Um, and then clutter, that I'm pretty sure is consistent with everybody I know. Right. Uh, I mean, this is like your your living space. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got. And you, and you kind of kind of have to let it flow. You can't spend all that time, you know, making sure it's always neat. Though you know, between projects, you you neaten it up. But while you're working on something, yeah, there's a mess. I I find that that always happens, uh, in in my spaces that I live in during the school semester or when right. I'm when I'm teaching or when I was a student. You know, at the beginning of the semester, it was all very neat. And as the semester went on, the mess got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then right. I'd straighten up before the next semester, and it's just this. You know, cycle of. So, so, Dave, what do you think? Are these are these five things true for you? Uh, they are certainly all true for me. I I for a little while didn't have a piano keyboard, but I have I have one again now. Yeah. Um, but anytime I'm I'm working really heavily, I've got I've got all of these things. Every once in a while, I can work in places without a door. Mm-hmm. I can work in public spaces, but it's not this. It's usually not the same kind of work. Right. Like I can't do really creative work. I can do more, um, like the so there's there's the the burst of inspiration kind of thing, and then there's like the slowly chiseling away at the block of marble kind of thing. And I can sometimes do a little bit of that second one when I'm when I'm in public. Yeah. If, if I'm you know working out some intricate counterpoint that's you know. Where it's turning on the more. engine, turning on the machine that you've practiced. Yeah, with. it's you a can, little bit more mechanical. Yeah. I can do that in public, and, mm-hmm. and you know, maybe a little bit of like orchestration stuff in public, like like in a coffee shop or something. Right. And certainly, you know, the the final final editing and cleaning up and, um, you know, typesetting kind of stuff I can do. Right. I- 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 anywhere, but. Yeah. I think for most of this stuff, the door is the only one that I, even on this list, can even sometimes go without. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, f- I find, I mean, what about, like, when you're not using a computer? Well, I mean, uh, when I'm not using a computer, then I can do without the monitor, but, right. um, th- you know, most of the time, there's a computer at some point in the process. And I think that's kind of, this is the, the creative space for the, the entirety of the process, you know. At yeah. the beginning, there may not be a monitor. At the beginning, the piano keyboard takes precedence over anything else. Right. Um, for me, anyway. Yeah. A lot of my composing, I often do even without a desk. Like, where, like I'm just, like, thinking and taking notes, and I end up writing a lot, a lot of about what I'm going to write before I do any writing, also. And, and so a lot of that stuff, like, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily have a door or a monitor or a keyboard or any of these things but and that's that's a different maybe a different stage of this but yeah the really working out like making making the big choices and trying to do it a bunch of different ways and taking that time then for for me yeah then most of these things are true right and, and sometimes it is at a coffee shop or whatever but i've got pretty good headphones so <laughs> that that operates as a as a good door for me as well even when i'm not listening to anything just to shut shut stuff out yeah yeah that's that's true um, I wonder, I don't know. I, I guess there are probably some people who still work without computers for, for which the, the monitor and, and the, uh, the, the digital keyboard are not there and they just have the piano and the mm-hmm. large sheet of paper. But yeah. I feel, I feel like that's kind of dying. One of the things that I feel like would almost make this list, like th- I, well, um, what about um, electronic music though? Do you need a keyboard for electronic music? Well, I mean... No, <laughs> but I mean, then then you need a whole different set of tools as right. well. Um, and I think the the musical keyboard might have its parallels to a, a good set of effects or a microphone or whatever. And actually, that for me, I end up, uh, a lot of the pieces I've written. I use some other instruments and a microphone, record stuff in, and then mess with it, and then write notes out of that. And and kind of have this this weird kind of uh, just like idea like getting ideas down as audio and then doing different kinds of transcription and doing lots of editing from there. Sometimes that's that's one of the processes I go through. Yeah. But 
Yeah. Yeah, I also do tons of drawing as well and other things. And But one thing that I feel like would, would almost make this list is a window. A window? Yeah. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> so you can I, I, stare with portent out the window? The, you know. So that the waving trees and the falling leaves might in, inspire my... <laughs> That's pretty much just when I'm writing romantic music, but <laughs> 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 no, I mean, but uh, often I like taking outside inspiration from different things, and and I and I I shy from the use of the word inspiration as well, but just like uh, getting ideas from being from doing something else and writing it down and then coming back to it later, and it, it and where a window is a little bit of a metaphor for that. Right. That's what I mean. Right. No, I hear I hear I hear that. All right. So we were thinking actually before we started the show that it would be really cool to see everyone's uh different perform or comp- composition spaces. Um so what what we would really love to do is to put together a collection of photos of wherever it is you write music. Um there are a lot of kind of collections of these for for generic you know computer workstations that everybody likes to you know this is my setup especially you know techie people um but what we we would really like you to do is to submit your photos of your workspace don't you know straighten it up or anything just you know take take a picture of your space wherever it is that you make music um, and we'd be really interested to see those. You can send those to us via email at soundnotion t or soundnotion tv at gmail dot com. But I think what would be cooler is if you're on Twitter, if uh, you would tweet a photo uh, using this hashtag uh, hashtag composer space, um, and then we can kind of build around this this hashtag, and then hopefully. We, we can put together maybe a little slideshow or something yeah. of, of a lot of these and we'll we'll put our spaces up as well um so we can kind of just compare notes i guess yeah and, and i i'm really curious to see how, how everybody else works i think that's kind of one of the really interesting things about uh rob's project is is seeing how all these different composers work so we have sam back now hey hey sam <laughs> welcome hey guys. back um, with, with great power comes great responsibility that's my right new, my that's, new audio setup right. today is give me trouble <laughs> <laughs> well we're, gl- we're glad you're back because we're going to talk about uh one of your favorite topics criticizing other people nice. <laughs> uh norman Lebrex, uh which is a, an entertaining little uh, writes an entertaining little blog at uh, uh, uh arts journal uh slip disc and uh he has kind of a little commentary on a, a little uh, music criticism uh, retreat kind of gathering that's going on this this week, um, and he he kind of takes Tony Tomasini to task on a recent review of a performance by Lang Lang, uh, and he he goes through about the first paragraph it in kind of startling detail sentence by <laughs> sentence and goes through and says this is what you did wrong in this sentence this yeah. is what you did wrong in this sentence really this is what you d-. and he's really really harsh really tells it like um it is. so criticizing the critics uh and you know very condescending i thought he he, he writes of the first sentence uh so the fir- here, here's an example the first sentence the superstar pianist Lang Lang may shamelessly cultivate a flamboyant persona. And then uh, Lebrecht writes in commentary, may or does cultivate? And why shamelessly? Do we know he feels no shame? Personally, I've found him very sensitive to his faults. In any event, adverb should be used sparingly as a last <laughs> resort. See me after class. Really? Oh, snap. See me after class, Norman? <laughs> Norm? So I loved this article because... Because it's mean to people and you're mean to people? <laughs> no, because I agree with his critique of the way most, or at least, you know, a lot of critical writing about music ends up functioning the way he's 
the way he's describing this piece. Right. However, he has crossed cleanly into the snarkosphere, <laughs> which is not necessarily the best way to, you know, encourage debate or, you know, uh, more effective communication between the critic and the people who want better criticism. <laughs> I, I like that term, the snarkosphere. I think I'm yes. going to start. People often talk about the Twitter sphere and the blogosphere. That's uh, right. But I think what we're Copyright. frequently talking about is the snarkosphere. Yeah, there's and, a show yep. title. Uh, yeah, I think that's where my blog lives in the snarkosphere. DavidMcDonaldMusic.com. <laughs> um, so <laughs> shame. That was the, I, and I feel shame, and you know that I feel shame because I told you just now that I feel shame. <laughs> that was a shameful plug, not to be confused with a shameless plug. Um, yeah. So anyway, not not really a lot to talk about, but if if you if you want to hear what Norman Lebrecht thinks about how people write about music, uh, you should check out this article. I, I I tend to agree with with you, Sam. There's yeah. a lot of really bad music criticism out there, but you know, institutes like this this one that he he mentions are um, hopefully a way that we can better music criticism uh he, he points out that the the kind of people leading these sessions are going to be alex ross friend of the show alex ross uh washington post's and majet uh the wall street journal's heidi wilson and uh former washington post critic tim page uh, so all these oh and former new york times critic john rockwell so i know for sure that i've read alex ross and majet and heidi wilson uh probably tim page as well uh, and I know that I, I respect all of these people's writings and I don't know if, uh, if, uh, Tony Tomasini is going to this particular event, but, uh, maybe not going to sit next to Norman Lebrecht in the music critic cafeteria <laughs> next week. <laughs> yeah. A little harsh. Yeah. Good writing is always good to encourage and. In, in the and the only way to encourage good writing is to rip on people who write bad stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what I, I learned in he, middle he, school. He could have kept <laughs> kept the the snark level down, but the, the, one of the most salient points to me, is, he says, "I have no idea what the sentence is trying to convey, other than a pejorative impression." That's a lot of criticism. It's basically you know three paragraphs of lots of metaphor and sort of poetic sounding descriptors that don't really describe anything that give you the impression they either did or didn't like the piece, but nothing other right. than that. Um, right. So I'm with him, but yeah. he, he should have been nicer. Yeah. Even anyway. Sam said that. So, you know, he's, he's harsh if Sam. That's said right. That. Yeah, that's right. I, so, <laughs> he's been called to the office and Sam says, can you think of a nice way to say that? More, <laughs> <laughs> more of a constructive more, criticism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the pick of the week. Pick of the week. We need a drop for that. We need an animated drop for this. Yeah. I'll you know? get on that in that. Yeah. Place. Yeah. We have our After Effects producer. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll have Sound Notion Graphics Department get on that. Yeah. A, a nice motion graphic drop for this. Um, anyway, on to our pick of the week. Our, uh, our pick of the week is uh, a really interesting recording um gregory spears requiem this is on new amsterdam i don't know if we've had a new amsterdam uh release mm, as a pick of the week yet uh yeah was she was she's amsterdam? i think she's she was her, her music was on new amsterdam there you go um anyway it's a, it's a really great artist owned label artist managed label uh just a couple of years old i think um but this is uh, again piece by gregory spears called requiem and one of the interesting things about it is that it is uh it uses period instruments um for new stuff which i think it, is always exciting it uses period languages too <laughs> yeah it's very very cool stuff yeah uh not just not just period instruments but period singing style as well yeah um yeah. It, it, when you listen to the the vocalists they sound like you know the the stuff that you get in the the anthology that comes with your copy of the grout um there is a flaw singing. in doing period instruments with vocal music though why well the people aren't that old uh oh. <laughs> just kidding anyway go on um <laughs> so anyway there's the, the the period singing style they're singing in latin middle french and breton 
which is the language of which with which I'm unfamiliar. Please criticize me later. Um, in Breton. In, in in yes, in Breton or Breton or whatever. Yeah, if you criticize me in that language, then I won't understand it. We'll both still be friends. Um, anyway, it's it's a really interesting look at these instruments, and what I think is even more interesting about it is that he's actually also using some of the vocabulary appropriate to these instruments so we still hear kind of the 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 same ornamentation that we expect in medieval and renaissance music um and it's it's almost as though he took some recordings of early music and remixed them and then Mm -hmm. went back and you know turned this thing into a performance of his remix Mm mm-hmm yeah to me it's interesting it sounds um it sounds not well you know like requiems have been written by a lot of composers um you know penderecki has got one john rudder andrew lloyd weber verdi berlioz etc cetera, etc cetera. and a you lot of those are just off the wikipedia article didn't you? that's right a lot of those are just big um uh you know big concert pieces and this is a concert piece but it really has the feel to like to me of, of a, like a requiem it feels like it's a very solemn i could see this being you know a ceremony to honor someone's death it's it's got the kind of patience that you might expect out of something that's really composed for that purpose rather than just a huge um like a giant form upon which to base a big concert piece yeah so let's listen to a little bit of it uh, there there are various kind of mixtures of old and new throughout this piece and we're gonna play a little bit of uh the second movement lux eterna is that right requiem eterna requiem eterna excuse me uh thinking george crumb all of a sudden uh so requiem eterna uh which is it really features the the kind of combination of vocal technique and kind of mashing that up with a more contemporary collage construction Mm -hmm. and so here's that So that was uh, an excerpt from Gregory Spears' Requiem. You can find it now uh, from New Amsterdam Records. Uh, there's, I don't think this is a standard ensemble, or I would I would give you their name. Um, but uh, so anyway, it's a really interesting recording of some some music that is a really compelling mix of old techniques and new techniques um, in, in old instruments as well. And uh, kudos to New Amsterdam for illustrating that they understand how the web works these days <laughs> and streaming that content for free, That's knowing that true. it's that it's going to be a great way to get people to actually purchase yep. the album. That's and true. The, the links are right under the player as well. So it's yeah. Whatever. So you can actually, and we'll, we'll link to this as well, you can actually stream this whole album, every track all the way through for free on, on New Amsterdam's website. Um, and if you'd like to take that music with you, then you can go ahead and purchase it from Amazon uh, or iTunes or anywhere that finer digital downloads are sold. That's right. They list so, e-music as well. They do list e-music, but whatever. You, I think you can also <laughs> find it at uh, Google Music, which is where I've been buying most of my recent music purchases. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, Gregory Spears' Requiem, check it out. Uh, let's go. That, that's going to do it, I guess, for this week's yeah. Sound Notion. Don't forget to send us pictures of your uh, your workspaces. We're going to put up pictures of ours as well. Um, 
Hashtag composer space. Hashtag composer space. Um, you can, we'll, we'll all gather around that hashtag on Twitter, and you can also just email us at soundnotiontv at gmail.com, um, and we're going to try to put together a little collage of, of some kind uh, with, with the submissions that, that we get there. Um, you can also use that email address and our website soundnotion.tv slash sn to comment on any of the stories i know we uh threw out some strong opinions about some of our topics this week mm. uh, which is something we don't normally do we're not really a big opinion kind of show um <laughs> but uh we did only this when week it's, so if, only when only when it's very 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 important right uh and also when it's completely unimportant yeah and all the time really we're really all the time <laughs> okay so what i did there was just lie to you we Anyway, we'd love to hear your opinions. We don't want to monopo- monopolize this conversation. We'd really like to be a platform for uh, this kind of discussion. So you can do that on our website, soundnotion.tv slash SN. We're also on Facebook and Twitter as at SoundNotion. Um, this show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store. You can subscribe there for free and catch every episode. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction ah. includes music by what? We've already got a hashtag composer space tweet. Awesome. Hey. Karina, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Karina. Sound Notion. <laughs> Thanks, Karina. Uh, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lev. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you back here next week.